a joint work with uh, Edita Pelantova. So the results are for both of us, but uh, of course, uh, all the, the possible mistakes or just the low quality jokes are completely on me. Next slide. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is it possible to do like full yeah, screen? Yeah, 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 yeah. Wait, wait, just a second. Okay. Uh, so actually the first question that is uh, why studying palindromes? I mean, uh, a common problem that, uh, that I have, or at least I had when it was possible to have parties with a small conversation is uh, explain your words, you're doing uh, theoretical computer science, uh, blah, blah, blah. But at one point arrived the question, okay, but how can you use this in the real world? What are the applications, the real applications? And at the beginning, I start talking about uh, DNA or computer science and stuff like that. But at one point, I decided to change strategy because I'm actually, I was actually quite frustrated by this uh, difference between mathematics and the real world. So my new strategy is saying that an application to the real world of palindromes is magic. And I, I start explaining that in a magical workshop uh, that was in London in the, okay, late 80s. You can stay on this slide, thanks. Uh, one of the speaker of this workshop decided to show how to create uh, a spirit. And a spirit as, as a function. And in this case, it was a spirit that uh, uh, can help you when you're stuck in the jam, when you're stuck in the traffic. And this spirit was in the shape of a cat, a cool cat with solar with, uh, sunglasses on a skateboard. And if you summon this uh, spirit, if you invoke the spirit, then the traffic will disappear, or at least if you invoke with the proper way, so doing the meow sound, at least you will level up the stress level. Now, wh why palindromes? Because at one point they had to decide the name of the spirit. And because of the nature of the coolness of the spirit, they decided to call go flow, go with the flow. But this was not magical enough. So one of the participants suggested actually to, we can say, to do the palindromic closure of this, uh, this name. So to obtain go flow wall fog. So palindromes, they're not only useful in biology or in computer science or in other aspects of mathematics, but also in magic. This was. Next slide. Okay, so I guess everyone knows what is a palindrome. A palindrome is a word that you can read from left to right, to right to left, it is the same. And uh, a very classical result on palindromes is that whenever you take a finite words having, n, having length n, then the maximum number of distant palindromes that can appear inside the world as a factor is n plus one, where the plus one is if you consider also the, the empty word. And when this happens, we say that the word is rich or rich in palindromes. Next slide. So for instance, the word pizza is a word of length five, and you can see that it has exactly six palindromes inside as a factor. So pizza is rich. Another example, next slide, is given by the word ananas, this pineapples in many language, including uh, Italian, French, Czech, and so on. And ananas as well is a word of length six, having exactly seven palindromes, the maximum uh, number of uh, palindromic factors. So both pizza and ananas, pineapple, are rich. On the other hand, next slide. On the other hand, one can check that Hawaiian pizza is definitely not rich. It has uh, length 12 and only 12 uh, palindromes. So uh, personally, I suggest to avoid it, at least as an example of uh, richness. Next one. Of course, the definition of richness can be extended in a very natural way uh, from finite to infinite words. In particular, we say that the word, the infinite word is rich if all its prefixes are rich. And we can also extend this definition on uh, languages or factorial sets, if you want for me, the two are the same, saying that a language or a factorial set is rich if all its elements, all the finest words inside the language are rich. 
There are several examples of Arno oh, sorry, of uh, rich words or rich languages. For instance, Arno Rosy words, uh, they are proved by the same paper by Xavier Drobet, by Justin and Pirillo, they, uh, they, they proved that Arno Rosy words, they are rich. The, an example is given by the Fibonacci word that we saw in the first uh, talk today. The Fibonacci word is rich uh, because any factor inside uh, as exactly the length plus one number of factors. Uh, some interval exchange sets, that means the coding of interval exchange is also rich. For instance, if you consider symmetric regular interval exchange, symmetric it means essentially that the permutation is the first interval goes to the last one, the second to the second to last, and so on. Whenever we consider this, um, uh, the language that you obtain by the coding, then we obtain also rich languages. And this was proved by Peter Balaji, Zuzana Masakova, and Edita Pelantova. Another example is given by dendritic sets. They are closed under reversal. Dendritic sets, uh, well, defined by a bunch of people, including me, Valérie, uh, Clélia, Dominique, uh, Christophe, Giuseppine, and Julien. Uh, well, they are defined in a particular uh, combinatorial way, essentially for to any word we associate uh, a graph, an extension graph having on the left is left extension, on the right is right extensions, and uh, as edges by extensions, and if, if, all of these graphs are acyclic and connect, then we say that they are uh, dendritic, that the set, that the language is dendritic. And for instance, the Fibonacci set, the set of factors of the Fibonacci word is an example of dendritic set. Whenever we have a dendritic set that is closed on the reversal, then we can prove that uh, actually this language is rich. Next slide. And then we have a lot of bunches of other classes of rich languages of rich words, for instance, the complementary symmetric rota words, or the, all the languages that are closed on the reversal and that have exactly 2n plus 1 factors of length n, and so on and so forth. Next one. So the question is if we fix an alphabet, the card an alphabet of cardinality um, having q letters, let's say, how many words of a specific length of length n can, uh, can we find that are rich? Now, of course, there is no precise formula. There are only some upper and lower bounds. And for instance, uh, using the results uh, from um, Josef Rukavitska or from uh, Juan Chuan Wu, the Charlotte and uh, Arsene Schur, we can see that the number of uh, rich words of a certain length in an alphabet of a certain cardinality is super polynomial on one hand, but sub exponential on the other. But still, these two bounds are quite far away, so we don't have any precise formula. So, next slide. So, uh, a way to improve these bounds could be to construct new rich words from uh, words that we already know are rich. So to study the way to preserve the richness of a word. Next slide. For instance, if we take again the Fibonacci morphism, we can see that whenever we apply the Fibonacci morphisms to a rich word, what we obtain is still rich. And actually we'll see that this is not only true for Fibonacci, but for larger classes. Next slide. And actually, we can pass quite easily from finite words to infinite words because there is a result from uh, Yetro Vesti saying that whenever we have a finite rich word, then we can construct both an aperiodic rich word and a, a periodic rich word, both having uh, the original rich word U as a factor. Uh, and of course, the, the, the main property is that this periodic word and this, this periodic word that we can construct, they are both rich. So we can study richness for starting from finite words and then obtaining uh, infinite words that are, have the properties that we, we like. Okay, so just to fix the notation, but uh, I'm sure that every one of you know what a morphism is, but just to give some definition again, to fix the notation. A morphism is essentially a map from uh, uh, three morphisms to another that uh, sends the, 
such that the image of the product is equal to the product of the images. And in the general definition, of course, we can consider two different alphabets, but for the sake, for the scope of this um, presentation, let's fix just, let's say from one alphabet to itself. A morphism is a, sub, uh, a substitution, uh, sorry, a substitution in a special morphism such that we can find a letter so, uh, where the image of a letter is a word that starts with a letter and that is going, growing and growing. And uh, whenever we consider the infinite uh, power phi to the omega of this letter, if all the prefixes, sorry, or the, the phi to the n for every n are prefixes of this word, we call this special infinite word the fixed point or a fixed point of the substitution. And we say that the morphism is, is primitive if whenever we consider a, a power of the morphism that is uh, big enough, then every letter is sent to a word that contains all other letters or all letters, if you want, as a factor. For instance, the Fibonacci morphism and that we saw before, uh, it's a substitution. We have the fixed point. This is just uh, the, the fixed point of phi omega of the letter A. And this is primitive because it is enough to consider the square of the morphism, phi square. And we see that uh, both A and B as, uh, are sent to words that contains both A and B as factor. Next one. And another uh, important definition uh, maybe most of you know, but maybe not all of you, is the conjugation of morphisms. We say that two morphisms must conjugate, and in particular, we say that the morphism phi is right conjugate to a morphism psi. If essentially we can pass from one to the other uh, by cyclically moving the last letter of the, of the images to the first letter of the one or if you want a more formal definition, if we can find a word X, maybe empty, maybe not, such that every letter A has the property that phi, phi A followed by this X, start with S and continue with Psi of A, or sorry, this word, Psi of A and X equal X Phi of A. And maybe it's easier to see as an, an example here in the Fibonacci, uh, we have that Sorry, no, this is not Fibonacci, it's not this morphism sending A to BBA and B to A. Then the one on the right is a right conjugate because what we do essentially we take the last A and we put at the beginning. Uh, a morphism say a morphism is said to be uh, the rightmost conjugate to another morphism if it's not possible to do this conjugation anymore. For instance, this uh, phi r here, the second morphism, uh, is rightmost conjugate because, uh, well, you can see that the last letter of the, the two images of the letter a and b are different. On one hand, we have b, on the other, a, so we cannot move this to the beginning anymore. And whenever we don't stop, uh, we'll have uh, that we can always do this uh, cyclic shift from one hand, from uh, one side to the other, then we say that uh, the morphism is cyclic but actually cyclic morphisms are not very interesting because we can see that they are all of a very trivial form that they essentially are just repetition powers of a letter. Every letter is sent to a power of a certain letter. Next slide. Can you hear me? More or less, but uh, not as well as before, but more or less. What about now? Better. Okay. So, no microphone. Okay. Um, now, why are we interested in a conjugation? Because whenever we want to um, uh, study uh, richness, actually, we are more interested in the languages than in the in the in, in the factor itself. So, in the words itself. And whenever we have two conjugate uh, morphisms, then for any word u that is recurrent, we need a recurrence, the languages of phi u, psi u, they coincide. So we can study, we can uh, decide uh, if we study just a morphism that, for instance, is the rightmost conjugate and forget about all the other conjugates because at one point we just focus on richness and richness is a property of the, the language that's not on the morphism itself. Next slide. 
yeah, uh, yeah, Sebastian, sorry, Sebastian just uh, told me that in the previous slide, I said uh, that, that, that is the power of a letter that's not completely true, is the power of a word for the cyclic morphism. Okay, um, the first family that we studied, actually it was already studied by a lot of people, or uh, the first class of morphism is very important, is the class of anorosimorphism. Uh, these anorosimorphism, they are essentially composition of uh, three kinds of morphism that are called elementary morphism. We have on one hand, the permutations, and then we have two special morphisms that let's call psi of letter A, psi tilde of letter A. The first one sends every letter or the first one puts the fix this letter A before any other letter. And the second one, the psi tilde, put a letter A after all the other letters. The Fibonacci morphism or the Fibonacci morphism are, for instance, Arnold Rosy. And this is quite easy to see because, for instance, the Fibonacci morphism can be obtained by first switching A with B. So applying a permutation A goes to B and B goes to A, and then applying the morphism, uh, putting uh, an A before the B. And the Fibonacci, for the Fibonacci, we also have something similar. We are first uh, apply a permutation on the letters, and then we put an A before all the uh, all the other letters. Next slide. And the subclass of anorosimorphism is the probably well the most well more well known class of standard Sturmian morphism. These are obtained just using the permutation of the two letters, so we are on a binary alphabet, and the Fibonacci morphism that, as we said, is obtained by using these two elementary morphisms. Next one. Now, already on uh, anorosimorphism, we have uh, some interesting result about richness. Because whenever we consider anorosimorphism and uh, uh, an infinite word that is the, with the, the properties is closed, this language is closed on the reversal, then we have that uh, this word is rich in the, if and only if the image using this anorosimorphism is rich. That means that not only this morphism psi preserve richness, but on somehow also the inverse of the morphism preserve richness. And this was proved by Amy Glenn, uh, Jacques Justin, Steve Wilmer, Lucas Zamboni. So just to be clear, an example, uh, if you start with the Fibonacci word that we saw before that is um, uh, rich and we apply another anorosimorphism, for instance, Tribonacci, what we obtain is another word this is different from Fibonacci, it's different from other things that we know, but that is still rich, still preserve richness. Next one. Another class, actually, maybe the, the class that we studied more uh, with Edita, it's uh, probably a less known class than Anorosi, is the class uh, of morphisms called Piret. Piret morphisms are morphisms that First of all, they are injective on uh, the letters. Okay, so we don't have redundancy. And the name Pirate is because uh, um, there is a special word, W, that's called a, a marker, that is a palindrome. And such that whenever we take the image of a letter followed by W, what we obtain is a palindromic complete return word to this marker. That means essentially there's a palindrome. And it is a, a, return, a complete return word, so it has only two occurrences of W, one as a prefix and the other as a suffix. Next slide. And of course, we can construct a lot of different examples of uh, pyrite morphisms. Uh, here there are three, well, the third one is uh, actually, you can pick your L and P and Q and they have an infinite number. But for instance, if you consider the first uh, morphism, Psi1, uh, well, of, of course, the morphism injecting on letters, the image of A and the image of B are different, but also we have uh, a special word, is the marker, it is the ABAABA, it's a palindrome. It's such that whenever we consider psi1 of A following by the marker, or even psi1 of B following by the marker, we obtain a word that is a palindrome, and it has exactly two occurrences of W. One, at the beginning as a prefix and the other at the, uh, the end as a suffix. Um, I just want you to notice that uh, uh, 
looking at the defini at definition, one could think that W it uh, needs to be always a prefix or a common prefix of all the letters of the images of the letters. And this is, for instance, the case of the third morphism, psi three. But this is not always the case in general, because for instance, in the second morphism, psi two, we have the, the marker BB is a prefix of the first image, A, image of A, but is not a prefix of the image of B. And uh, the extreme case is in the, in the first morphism, psi one, where the marker is neither a prefix of the first image of the letter nor of the second image of the letter. Next one. Okay, but which morphisms are in this class? Okay, we saw three examples, but can we find other classes? First of all, it's quite easy to see that uh, um, every permutation is a morphism in class P red because we just have uh, as a marker the empty word. Next one. Then, if you consider the elementary or, or, or rosimorphism of kind of psi of A, that means the one that puts an A before every different letter, then this is also in class P red. And in this case, the marker, it's simply the letter A itself. You can see that the definition follows well. Next one. So what about the other elementary neurosimorphism, the psi tilde? Well, unfortunately, these are not in class P red, but we can easily see that the, they are conjugate to morphism in class P red. So again, when we are interested only in languages, then we are, we are happy anyway. Next one. And actually with, uh, with Edita, with Atalantova, we proved that uh, every anorosimorphism, I mean, this is just a consequence of this, these three facts that we saw, that every anorosimorphism, that is a, concaten a concatenation of, um, a composition, sorry, of uh, these three kinds of elementary morphism, every anorosimorphism is conjugate to a morphism in class P red. Next one. Then uh, class P red is a relatively new uh, class of morphisms, but still, I mean, 10 years at least, but still there are a lot of results. For instance, uh, we know that this class is close under composition and actually also have a formula on how to find uh, the marker whenever we have two different uh, uh, morphisms in this class. I think I will skip the detail, but I'll just give an idea. Next one. And they are actually related to a probably a more known class of morphism that is the, the morphism of class P. A morphism is said to be a, a class to belongs to class P if we can find a palindrome P such that all images are sent to a, a, a word that starts with P and ends with another palindrome that depends on the letter of A. Now, if you are familiar with the definition of, if you think about that 10 seconds, you will actually see that the, any fixed point uh, of a substitution in this class contains infinitely many palindromes. So not necessarily rich, but still we, are, we have some interesting property. And the thing that's interesting, that, uh, that is interesting for us is that whenever we consider morphism in class P red, this is not necessary in class P, but this is conjugate to a morphism in class P and actually not to any morphism, but also to a morphism that's a cyclic. Next one. Uh, did we have one implication, but on the, other, on the other side, we can find counterexample of morphisms that are a cyclic, they are in class P, but such that they have conjugates, uh, they are not in class P right. Here is an example, if you consider this morphism psi, and we consider this rightmost conjugate psi r, then we can check that uh, this wr should be the marker, but actually when we consider uh, the, the composition psi r of the letter a followed by the marker, this is not a complete return word to the marker because we have more than two occurrences of the marker. In this case, we have actually four. So we have one side, but not the other for, this is not a full characteriz characterization, this one in the proposition. 
Next slide. So uh, another, the, the, probably the last I hope uh, definition is the of a marked morphism. We say that the morphism is marked if the mapping that send every letter to the, well, the right mark, mark if the mapping and send every letter to the last letter in the rightmost morphism is injective. And let's just consider here the example of Tribonacci, the Tribonacci that coincides with the rightmost. Here we have A goes to AB, so the last letter is B. The last letter of the image of B is C, and C, the last letter is A. So this is the, uh, we have a permutation of an injective. Left mark is defined symmetrically with uh, using the leftmost uh, uh, morphism. And whenever we have a morphism that is both uh, left mark and the right mark, we say it is marked. For instance, here the Tribonacci is uh, marked. And whenever we have not only an injection, but also the identity, we said the morphism is well marked. So in this case, Tribonacci is marked, but is not well marked because A goes, the, the, the last letter of the rightmost is not A, but is B. Next slide. On the other hand, if we start with a morphism that in, a, in a, the class P red that we have studied, we know that if this morphism is right marked, then we have that is left marked for free and then it's marked, just marked for free. Not only that, but uh, if we consider not the morphism itself, but one power of the morphism long enough, and this is interesting for us because again, we are, uh, we are focusing uh, on the languages. So the language does not change when we consider the, the powers. Not only this is marked, but it's also well marked. And as an example here, Tribonacci, we saw that it was marked, but not wet marked. But whenever we consider this, the, the cube of Tribonacci, we have that actually the last letter uh, of uh, the, the rightmost um, conjugate coincide. So it's the identity. We have A goes to A, B to B, and C to C. And the same for the first letter of the leftmost uh, right conjugate, uh, right, leftmost conjugate. Next one. So um, we prove several results on this marked morphism in class P red. And I'm gonna give you just this slide of results. There are several more ones, but uh, uh, I don't want to uh, give too much technical detail. But one result is very important is that if we start with a, a morphism that is marked in class P red, and if consider a word such as this, for fact, this, uh, this set of factors is closed on the reversal, then if the image of this word is rich, then the word is rich itself. So we have one of the two implication that we saw uh, on uh, Arno Rossi morphism. So the question is, slide, what can we say about the other direction? <laughs> slide. Unfortunately for the other direction, we don't have uh, uh, a general result, but we have several small, uh, several small, several particular results, for instance, on binary alphabets. If you consider a morphism only on an alphabet only on two letters, that is in class P red, and is marked, but actually this is, we are, when we are considered a binary morphism, this is uh, quite easy to see. Then if we have this special uh, technical condition that AB, the image of AB followed by the marker is rich as well, then we can give, we can, uh, give some results. For instance, if we start with a word that is recurrent and rich, then we have the other implication. That means that the image of this word is rich. Not only that, but uh, if the, the, the morphism is primitive, then any of this is fixed point that of course coincide with the image is rich as well. Next one. And then we have a lot of other results. For instance, we can prove that uh, whenever we start with, sorry? Нет, это конференция. Меня пригласили послушать. Okay. I think someone was not muted. Someone left their mic on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we have other results that well, I will maybe tell it very quickly that if we start with um, uh, if you know that uh, you is sent to a rich word and you is a recurrent, then for any other recurrent rich word, we have that V, we have that V sent also to a rich word. 
and plus other results on the same uh, style. Next one. But um, so just to sum up what uh, I said very quickly and with uh, some <laughs> interruption and with some technical problem, what I want to show you, what I want you to um, take away from this uh, talk is that we found a new way to construct new rich words starting from rich words that we already knew. For instance, we can apply uh, our or a morphism of class pirate or a norosimorphism to some word that we already know and find a new class or new examples of rich words. That doesn't matter if we start with finite rich word because we can always find a way to find infinite rich words. And these infinite rich words not only are, are rich, but they can be uh, periodic or aperiodic, how we like. And more interesting, actually, we can improve the, the bound, at least the lower, the lower bound that we saw at the beginning by constructing new rich words. For instance, um, uh, Chuan Guo, uh, Jeff Charlie, and uh, Arsene Schurz proved that all the words that are of this form, powers of A, powers of B, powers of A, powers of B, where these powers are with um, uh, exponents that are non decreasing. <laughs> The okay, they are rich, so we can apply to this family of words uh, one of the morphisms that we saw before and obtain new classes of rich words. And to conclude, next slide, I want just, just to point out that actually there are still a lot of open questions that are related to that. For instance, I talk about uh, elementary or neurosimorphous, but there are also other kind of morphisms that are interesting. And one example is given by the tame morphism. Tame morphism are a composition of elementary tame morphism that quite over example, uh, resemble the anorosy morphism, but they are a little bit different. The idea is that we have gained two classes of morphism where we put a letter A before or after just one particular other letter B, not all the other letters like we did in the elementary anorosy. And using this uh, tame morphism, we can actually describe uh, new interesting classes of sets. For instance, we have a characterization of dendritic uh, languages uh, using aesthetic characterization, stuff like that. But we have also other open questions. So if you are willing to, to, to study that, for instance, uh, uh, we, I show you at the beginning that whenever we start with a dendritic language that is close on the reversal, then it is rich. But we still don't have a full characterization of all the dendritic languages that are close under reversal. We know that anorosy languages or some particular interval exchange are close under reversal, but which other are and which are not. And then, of course, uh, we have other results connected strictly to counting, uh, well, to computing a bound or the exact numbers, if this is possible, of finite rich words for. A give, for a given alphabet of a given length. And we can also use these results for the study of critical exponents. Uh, for instance, uh, Asim Banwell and Jeffrey Charlotte, they propose some lower bounds for um, um, infinite rich words with a minimal critical, uh, critical exponent when the cardinality of the alphabet is two, three, four, or five. And uh, recently, um, there was a result by Campersal, uh, Moll, and Curry that say that 4K equals two is actually the best option, but we still don't know for three, four, and five if we can find something better or not. So studying the, the richness uh, and constructing a rich world could also help to, to answer these kind of questions. Next one. And thank you, I can stop here. Thank you, Francesco. The nice talk. Uh, we're running late, but maybe if we have a very quick question, we can take it. Anyone? Well, if not, then thank you again, and we can oh, move. Thank to you. Next.